Um, tonight I have the pleasure to introduce um, Sigrid Brell. She came from Aachen. Um, she's for the last decade she has been pioneering easy to use um, uh, <laughs> industrial robots for creative industries. Um, she is um, chair of for production architecture at the R RWTH um, Aachen University and, and president of Association of for Robots in Architecture. And, and right now she's chief editor for the Springer Journal for Constructive Robots. Okay, well, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, maybe uh, for your interest, I've put some uh, of my personal path in the last uh, seven years. Uh, apart from that my background is architecture, from art school actually, now I shifted more or less quite into uh, technology and technolo uh, technological in development. So one of um, one part was the spin-off association of TU Vienna, which is the Association for Robots in Architecture. And in about three years ago, I started the new chair for individualized production in Aachen with about two researchers. And now, today, we are about 12 re researchers uh, with uh, different backgrounds. Uh, we have architects, we have engineers, we have computer scientists, but also we have artists so far. Um, and also what I'm going to introduce uh, is another new center that we've just founded uh, this year. But maybe just for you to understand where I come from, um, so this was one of the first projects I actually was working on for the whole period of three years. And um, at that time, more or less, the computer-aided design was, even though it was a computer, it was very manually driven. So we were actually drawing, just similar to how we were drawing by hand. And so very soon I, I was thinking about, you know, how can we create support systems for our design decisions. And one important factor was actually incorporating uh, fabrication and production parameters. And another thing that I realized on the construction site was even though the, the project was drawn in a computer, um, the construction site was very manually driven so every, like even though we had the 3D model and even though we had the plans, uh, people would just uh, weld by hand and mount by hand and everything. And we also had one big problem because when you look at the, at the facade, this was rectangular and then we had to actually uh, uh, We, we had to, um, again, split the facade into triangles. So one of my first research projects was more or less how to trick computer-aided design software so that you actually get a soft, uh, an offset of uh, a multi-layered facade because our computer-aided design software actually does not incorporate any fabrication uh, parameters. So this was one of the first patterns. And now, all of a sudden, when you look at uh, software and when you start changing um, the parameters, you can actually um, optimize. In, in this case, we optimize the surface so that you can actually planarize it. And you have these character lines and, they, and then the, the planner um, parts of the, of the main structure and then you can actually optimize the whole surface. So at that time, more or less, most important was that we thought we can trigger the fabrication constraints only by mathematics and that we, can, uh, that we incorporate the, the building tolerances of material into the design process so that we can actually build any freeform shape. So this project more or less was th the only thing we drew in the computer-aided design was the initial surface 
and then everything was automated by software. So we could have the design decision uh, support in what is the actual ideal uh, plate size to be fabricated and so on. Um, so this was one part where I researched in about like for 10-15 years. Uh, but then the second part was more or less that I came up, uh, that I saw this picture, uh, which is a vision of the French artist Vilma at the beginning of the first industrial uh, revolution, wh where they envisioned what different profess uh, professions are going to work in the year 2000. And you can see here that they ima imagined that the architect actually is going to control a mechanized uh, construction site. And um, as we no know now, uh, this is not in reality, but we are getting close or closer. Another thing uh, which is important is why we definitely think that we have to do more research in the construction industry is that every second euro, at least in Germany, is spent in building or construction. So it's bigger than parts of the car industry, it's bigger than tourism, it's nearly as big as the, the German overall budget. So, uh, and even though it's, it's surprising that uh, the technology is still not even the second industrial revolution, where for instance the car industry is in the fourth revolution, industrial revolution. So when you look at, for instance, productivity, then you can see that there is a big difference in pre-production and on the construction side. So if we have 50 square meters per man hour in a single product like in a window, we not even get close to one square meter of a man hour uh, on the construction side. So we, there is a difference of 50 times in between uh, both uh, construction technologies. So that's one of the reasons very often because everybody thinks that prefabrication can be the solution. But on the other hand, we do know that the building stock is very important for us. Also that we probably will have to reuse a lot of building stock in the near future without just uh, running down the projects or, or old buildings. Because uh, about in, in North Rhine-Westphalia, about 90% of the new projects are with existing building stocks. So only 10% of the new buildings, of the new projects, are run down from the green area and built completely new. Then another experience that I had as an architect, yeah, just uh, when you look at, um, at, the, at the data stream, is that the planning nowadays, compared to Kunsthaus Graz about 18 years ago, is that nowadays we have a very good planning um, data flow. But at the time where it gets to the construction site of an architect, maybe 1% of the data uh, information that you have produced is actually reaching the construction site. So one of the problems at the moment is also that we keep collecting data or the same data over and over again, we do this in the planning phase, then we construct it, and then we do it again for facility management and so on. So there is really a big need uh, uh, and also that for, for digitalization that we have to tackle actually. And we totally believe that one turnkey technology can be industrial robots. So when you look at this image, for instance, and you see uh, how cheap you can buy them nowadays. Uh, many of you maybe know that about 20 or 30 years ago, we bought for the same amount uh, just computers. And now we can, nowadays we can buy machines for the same amount. And we realized that a lot of people in our community, especially students, they just buy a used robot, put it in the garage, and they just start making. Uh, so they can actually produce products with the robots. So, um, industrial robots can be a low barrier because you can just combine a simple tool with an industrial robot and you can create a process. 
Um, on the other hand, we realize that when you look uh, at the fear within construction and within the architecture field, you never know um, what is going to um, or where digitalization is going to lead to and people fear that machines are going to control our lives in very soon, similar that we fear, I don't know, that we get addicted to smartphones and so on. So this is also something that we have to actually think about what is happening when our tools are changing. Yeah? So do you, do you adapt to, to um, how, to eat, how you eat food or can you actually con still control uh, the machines? So one research area that we are looking into is communication and especially communication strategies for man-machine control. And uh, one, um, one enabler, especially for the creative industry, is bringing machines and also the knowledge about machinery uh, visualized. Yeah? So you do not really necessarily have to understand what inverse kinematics is uh, as soon as you see how robots work and as soon as you can simulate uh, a process. Yeah? So in this case, we're not only simulating the toolpath, but we are also simulating the process uh, from the robot. You can see that, um, for instance, if the robot is reaching all the positions or if the robot is colliding it by itself or if the robot is more or less um, going into singularity. And you can also analyze, for instance, each single axis and then you can optimize it. And then as soon as you have simula the simulation of, of the process, you can actually put intelligent algorithms on top of it, like genetic optimization, and you can incorporate fabrication knowledge. In this case, for instance, how to place the workpiece in the best way in front of the robot so that it can most efficiently work with the, uh, with the workpiece. This is also something where we think that robots can be mediators because they can store knowledge. And you can actually continue on that storage of knowledge and you can enhance it. And this is also something where we see when we have the generation conflict that, for instance, in the production unit, workers are retiring and new workers have to start with a machine. Very often the old workers, they can't even explain what they've been doing for a long time in their Excel sheets because they can't remember how they solved uh, mathematics um, or yeah, they, sometimes just something works and you don't know wh why it's working. So as soon as when you store the knowledge in, in the machine, then the knowledge does not get lost and you do not have to start new. And then, of course, you can also incorporate, for instance, your work environment. This is an example where my people at RWTH decided at 10 o'clock in the evening to actually paint my wall in front of my office. And you can see that we actually planned everything in the CAT environment, even though we know, do know that, that any wall is not planar. Yeah? So actually we have to, we have to, ha like, we have to connect the virtual world together with the, with, the, uh, with the real world. And in this case, we use the intelligence of robots uh, with the force talk sensors. So the robot is totally blind. Uh, we do not have cameras, but the robot feels and when it touches the wall. And when you have a certain force, then it starts the process. <coughs> then the next thing is, uh, when you further think in, in this direction, is that we truly believe that in the near future, not only people are going to control and drive robots, but maybe material by itself, by their own properties, are going to control robots. In this case, uh, we connect the, the, the CAT environment, the KUKA PSC, which is, by the way, developed by Johannes Braumann, um, with some physical control. And there is a reason why we have this retro box. We do not use hand, like mobile phones or smart pads or anything, because actually, we just change three or four parameters 
just by a slider similar to our, to our computer simulation. And then actually the Cooker PSC is not only a simulation, it's actually a direct control. So what you see in this video now is that uh, in milliseconds beforehand, the worker actually or the user actually sees in the visualization what the robot is doing. And then a, millisecond, a couple of milliseconds later, the robot is immediately executing. And this is what we realize very often in the fabrication, that in the first couple of seconds, you realize if, uh, if, if the uh, process is working, because you can hear, for instance, when it's milling, you can hear if it's milling correctly or if you have to enhance speed or if you have to reduce speed and so on. So this is something you can actually live control or maybe very intuitively control the process just by controlling the speed within, uh, within the, the software and directly on the robot. And you do not have to offline program it again. And then uh, when we come back to this um, force talk sensor robots, then, or the human collaborative robots, as they, they are called too. The, uh, then you see that in this video, you do not really know who is controlling who. Yeah? Is, is the person controlling the robot or the robot controlling the person? And this is possible because you actually control the workspace. So in this case, the robot is constrained in a parameter space of a freeform surface. And as soon as the person tries to push the robot out of the workspace, the robot is actually resistant. Yeah? So it, does not let him, like, it doesn't let himself actually uh, get out of the workspace. So this is what we call human uh, robot collaboration, when the robot and the, and, the, and the person actually communicate, in this case, by, uh, by haptic control. In the, in the production or pre-production, there are a lot of robots, but uh, we truly believe that uh, the systems that uh, a lot of uh, people try to um, transfer from automotive industry to the construction does not work because we have a lot of individual products. We do not have to, like we, 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 we do not have to necessarily control the production line in such a precise way, like in, in, in the car where all, everything is assembled at the same time. So we think we have to actually um, open up uh, the, the, a more intuitive space and just by understanding processes and then by interacting with the robot in haptic control. So in this ca case, you do not only have the haptic feedback, but you also have the visual cues that tell you if you are within the program, if the robot, for instance, does understand that there is a workstation where a process is pre-programmed, then it connects within the cloud with other machinery. And then the person actually um, um, controls if the robot is doing the first process correctly. And if it doesn't do the process correctly, you can actually help the robot to optimize it. So this is what we call the parameter space. So we have the parameter space in our CAD environment where we uh, create the process as designers. Then we do actually have the human assistance. So to optimize the process with the human interaction. Then we have the optimization and readjustment of the process also with the direct feedback in our software. And then we can also incorporate haptic parameter definitions. So actually also the robot can ask the, the, the person uh, during the process for help or for a precise uh, definition of some types of the process. This is for instance shown here in the video where it connects with a normal table saw. And again, we do not have the control similar to automotive industry where we use cameras. Again, the robot is totally blind. Uh, it navigates within the workspace, but we have real-time calibration uh, during uh, the process. So in this case, the workpiece is calibrated to the machine and then it 
actually works precisely. Uh, but then to the mounting position, the robot again goes blind. And in this case, the, the, the human assists for the, correct, uh, for the correct position of the mounting. So we see robots actually as <coughs> assistants and uh, so, so that they help us in, in work that we maybe do not want to do. So we do not actually want to carry <laughs> the workpiece around. We do not want to measure uh, where the workpiece has to be positioned, but we want to have still the human eye for, uh, for the control if the process is correct. The next part is, of course, what we are working on at the moment is um, to incorporate these platforms uh, cloud-based um, so that we actually can distribute uh, parts of the process and that we can also reuse different processes and we do not really have to identify the geometry, but at least we have the process in, in form of, uh, of strategy. So this is more or less now what we do in pre-production. Uh, another um, thing that interests us is actually demolition. Um, because what I've said before is uh, material can be reused and at the moment we just crush everything. So in our research uh, we think that we have to remove hazardous material or, materi like, or waste. I mean, we do have material that lasts for different years. So usually paintings or wall uh, or uh, floor is maybe up to 10 years, but concre concrete, for instance, lasts forever. So we truly believe that we will have to uh, deconstruct in a controlled way in, in the near future uh, building stock so that we can reuse it. Uh, because one of the biggest um, transmission of uh, uh, CO2 is actually concrete. Yeah? It's, 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 it's far worse than anything else that the car industry or whatever. Uh, just the production of concrete is really what we have to reduce in the, in the near future. Or also in this case, bricks. Uh, as you can see here, when I started at RWTH, this was one of the facilities of one of my colleagues that we just deconstructed. And we used uh, uh, a normal industrial robot. But of course, these robots are not there for work like that. Uh, but even though in, in our small robotic lab, we can train processes. So we use at the moment industrial robots because they, are, they have the intelligence to understand how processes should be driven or should be developed in the, in the near future. So here again, you have this force talk sensor control where actually then uh, the tool is fiddled in and corrected just by the understanding um, of the robot. Okay, am I hitting the wall in the correct way? Yes or no? And this is, for instance, just to get rid of plaster. But now what we are doing is we transfer our knowledge from industrial robotics to actually building machinery. And very similar to the very first project where you saw the robot actually uh, using uh, a wooden stick and uh, a and peg and hole problem, uh, we met a company here um, that is actually, oops, okay, this is a bit loud. Um, also in, in, in tunneling. And they have a similar problem. You, you can see here a lot of holes. And you wonder why are they producing so many holes? Yeah? They are producing so many holes because the person who is actually re remote controlling the machine does not exactly know if it can hit the right hole or if it can hit any of these holes. Yeah? So this is actually, again, a lot of work is done just uh, for the sake of not knowing where the, where the machine is posi positioned in front of the workspace. So again, we, we can do process anal analysis. And now we can incorporate our knowledge of simulation and also of machine control so that, that we can analyze if a three meter long tool can actually hit 
the whole and how are the joints actually behaving and is the machine, um, can we optimize the machine? And then the next point is, for instance, that we can again incorporate inverse kinematics. So what we started 10 years ago with industrial robots, we're actually now starting step by step with uh, uh, building um, or, or construction safe uh, machinery. And um, you can see now again in the next uh, video scene that we can again in incorporate the genetic algorithms to understand, okay, how many positions does such a robot, for instance, need to actually hit the wall or hit as many holes as possible uh, of this hole? So this would be, just in terms of efficiency control, that you can actually reduce the amount of holes that you have to drill into the stone and that you can actually then also uh, control very precisely what the robot is doing. And this is what you see now in our facilities at RWTH, while we are hacking a machine that is not, does not have the same intelligence um, as the industrial robots, because here you can see, of course, the joints do not uh, know uh, where, they are, where they are, because we do not have any uh, sensors within the joints, so we just track them to understand what the robot is doing and if, it, if the robot is executing our commands correctly. So to finish up, I want to, I want to talk a little bit of the, of the association because I also think this is important when we want to really change construction industry in a very short amount of period. Yeah? It, it, it's also a, the mass of brains what is important. So, and also interdisciplinarity and collaborative network. So we, like uh, with, together with Johannes Braumann, about uh, six years ago, we founded this association in 2000 and, and uh, sorry, in 2010, eight years ago. Uh, and and um, we have uh, more or less um, the, the web platform where people can actually download uh, the KUKA PSC software but also where we sh share a lot of videos and also um, information about publications, but also just we help each other um, in the user forum when people start uh, starting with robotics. Uh, because that is also the goal of the association that we want to en enable the creative industry that they can just use a robot to, um, to, to start prototyping. Um, and what is also what I keep uh, showing uh, more or less also the um, uh, industry is that we, we always say, okay, the decision makers, they are not interested in robotics at the moment, but also the young digital natives, yeah, they are interested in robotics. And this is also the task that we all have is we have to, we have to create good jobs yeah, for people that they are interested in, in digitalization and you can't bring people at the construction site back to, I don't know, the Stone Age, where they have to take a hammer and they have to carry everything by their hand because this is also uh, in statistics that everybody who has, can start with a joystick, they are the happiest people, the happiest worker. And this is something where construction or robotics can contribute. And of course, also the network, and our network is coming from automotive entertainment is a very interesting area where we look into a lot, but also fabrication and aerospace. And for instance, these are our, I just want to show a couple of our members like Boeing. And yeah, for the robot, it doesn't matter if it's, it, if it's a part of an airplane or if it's a, a flat surface or a curved surface. If you have the control that you just tell the robot as, as a control strategy, be normal or follow the surface in normal tra trajectories. What we also see that we have members who are very creative, so they just build their own mobile platforms uh, for their own tasks, like in this ty uh, type, um, the, like the nuclear agency, just for uh, inspection. <laughs> or we also see a lot of startups that just start 3D printing, win a lot of competitions here for the mass, for instance, how to 3D print houses for NASA. 
And we also do not have to look very far. This is a project that, that, that we have been uh, looking after also with, with the software that, uh, yeah, this is a typical project where the worker retired and then they thought, okay, do we have to uh, close down the robot or are we going to find some young um, individual? I think that's my phone, sorry. <laughs> And if you go to Stuttgart, for instance, now and go to the railway station, then you can see um, that, um, that this company now is actually doing all the scaffolding and molds for, for the concrete work. And they started a new business model with that. Yeah. And one last pro very last project is uh, if you know Formula One, or yeah, this is. Uh, uh, where artists, more or less, they, they just got a robot and they produced everything by themselves. So this is a so-called lost foam um, procedure where you uh, produce uh, EPS, positive molds, and then you put them into the sand bed and the, the hot aluminium actually evaporates. Uh, so, so all 88 parts are actually individual parts and the EPS foam just disappears. And you can see here that, that more or less also the workspace was developed, further developed by the artists by themselves. So we actually just did a technology transfer. And um, yeah, this was the son of the artist. He actually studied tourism, so he had not, nothing to do with, um, uh, with uh, robots or a CAD system before. And yeah. This is more or less where I want to finish. Uh, when you incorporate the design together with the fabrication, you can actually change the design in real time and still keep the control of the machinery in real time and streamline the whole data flow and process. So this was how we started in 2012. This is not a, this is not a speed up of the video. This is really how fast the, the control data files got produced at that time. And at the moment, we, what I showed before, we just sent this in life, in, 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 real, in close to real time to the robot. Yeah, that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, then let's start with questions. Does anyone want to start? Um, yeah, please. Yeah. Um, so, so you already said at the beginning of the talk that it's going to be a bit technical, but you also have a background in, in, in you went to a Kunstakademie, mm -hmm. a background in architecture. And I think the um, arc that you showed, not this one, but the wooden arc that you showed earlier, yeah. might have been the first example where I saw a robot helping out or, or supporting an art project, mm -hmm. which is... I think something that a lot of people think is not really possible because robots lack creativity. Um, my question is because I think uh, they can definitely help and support that, but I think that also changes the process and therefore changes the way people become creative and the way people create. Mm. How do you think that will change, for example, artistry in the future? Um, I think it can change a lot because if you regard a robot as a tool, yeah, I mean, uh, artists are tool explorers. Mm. Yeah? Um, and robots can enhance the way we, we work and also the way we think and also the way maybe they can, they can produce or they can assist in, in, in procedures where usually, you know, like as stonemasons, you had helpers or younger stonemasons who, who did the hard work for you, mm. and then you just did the finishing. Yeah? So the artist will always be, um, the artist will always be the owner of the creative process. Yeah? This is what I'm, what I believe in, or maybe should stay in the creative process, or at, at least be, I don't know, a dirigent yeah, of, of the whole process. But, uh, but you, you can outsource a lot of uh, things to, to machines. Yeah? And this outsourcing process, I think, is very interesting because, I mean, I'm lazy, 
and if if I can if if I can produce uh, software that can adapt to different processes, yeah, mm. because the logic is similar, and you just change the object or the geometry of an object, then why sh should uh, why shouldn't I uh, produce a piece of software to assist me or and then a, a helping hand? By a robot that assists the process, because then I can be more creative. Mm. Then I can have my brains into other projects, because then I have my little crowd of workers, and they just do <coughs> what I what I could have been doing by my own, maybe in the th 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 ten times. Yeah. Uh, uh. Mm. So I just think. Uh, mm. People or artists have always adapted, and it, it, I mean, that's why it is so. That's why I wanted to stop with this art art uh, art project of the Red Bull Ring, yeah, because the first implementation we did was actually directly with a 27 meter and 23 arch, and this is this also has to do. Um, maybe with a certain positive, what I always call naivety. Yeah, so if, if we are naive in terms of uh, technology and we do not fear it, yeah, we just, like a child, yeah, a child just takes everything uh, in a very uh, um, normal and very uh, positive way. Yeah? If, if you give a child a robot, it just starts playing with it without fear. Yeah? Uh, and this is, I think, what uh, this, this, this creativity from childhood is something that is still preserved in artists. Mm. A lot of people lose this yeah, in, when they grow up. But artists, yeah, they, they, they have the methods to keep this uh, um, curiosity, this naivety, just trying out things, experimenting. Mm. And this is something which is very important in the creative process that I think we have to, we have mm -hmm. to foster. Mm -hmm. um. Um. Um, maybe one question. <laughs> 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 maybe a, a shorter <laughs> answer. <laughs> a long no, question, no, short it's, answer. It's, um, actually, the question can be formulated in a short way. Um, I had to think, <laughs> uh, think about a lot about I do follow um, projects like uh, this skyscraper building robots and stuff. It, it's actually, there's uh, several things going on, but um, not in like this dimension as you presented the, the projects. And I'm quite fascinated, but on a kind of society level, I think it's a huge problem for jobs, actually. I mean, there is this, this period, it's the same for automated driving, that in between the start of automated driving and the end of people one people having the job of driving somewhere, and I think it's the same in, in construction, um, that's going to be a problem. I mean, not that what it's, it's what, really what time, a type of problem? That you think that people lose their jobs, or that you think that we do not have enough job, like en enough people for doing this type of job? No, I think that it's going to be a problem that um, we have, like, if, for example, you take away um, driving as a job, yeah. then it's going to create a huge problem because there are lots of people doing this as a job and you can't yeah, yeah, train them to be a computer scientist or something like this, yeah, not yeah. in this short period okay. of time. And I think, like, let's say after some decades, it's not, it's not going to be a problem anymore because then all the people are retired. But yeah. in this transition zone, I think it's a huge problem. And I think, um, for example, autonomous driving is identified as, as a huge problem for jobs. Mm -hmm. But if kind of you hit the construction area in, with yep. the same intensity, um, then it's, yeah, at least for some decades, a little bit a problem. Well, actually, the, the, the lack or the lack of employees is the actual driver why a lot of construction companies are now looking into, uh, in, into robotics and automation. Because, for instance, there is a survey in, um, f especially in the UK, like they, they have it on a political level already that there is the construction 2025 roadmap. Yeah? So, so the, the, they, they do know that in a couple of years they do not have enough bricklayers to actually build houses. Yeah? And I think this will be a, a big 
society problem that we will not be able to produce the housing uh, for society and, and, and we can't uh, come up with the need uh, and we can't produce, for instance, also affordable housing. Yeah? So there, there is this pressure on construction companies at the moment, you know, how can you produce affordable housing? And we do know that the quality at the moment, um, from a technical point of view, is high. But the problem is the assembly point. I mean, we, we, we do not have uh, enough people and we do not have well-educated people on the construction side. Yeah? So, so our idea is that, you know, when you remember the very first image where the architect actually is taking control on the construction side again, we, we want to bring more engineers back to construction and more architects again back. And we want to make the construction site um, a good job environment. Yeah? So, so if, for instance, you can do your part of the planning also in real time on the construction site, actually you see the problems yeah? uh, directly and you can solve, because a lot of problems on the construction sites uh, are solved directly on the construction site, but the people who planned it, they are not there anymore. Yeah? So, so we have to streamline the way and also the workspace. Um, and I, I truly believe, because that's what I find most interesting as an architect, is I want to, you know, I want to touch, I want to have the feeling, I want to see how things are put together, because that's something, you know, similar when you go through the car assembly, People like to work in these companies because then they go to the production line and then they can see immediately the product. So that's why we lose a lot of good engineers to the uh, automotive uh, manufacturing because cars are just sexy. Yeah? And construction is dirty and construction is you know, not very, uh, yeah, it, it's not very well established or well known in society. So, so we do hope that with uh, good machinery, and with the, the playfulness of machinery, we can bring back good brains directly to, to the construction site. Thanks for answering the question. A long answer, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so I've been thinking, if you utilize robots in the construction site and they can do everything kind of in real time and they, they need kind of a hardware back end somewhere and how do you what do you think how can we solve something like that because there's a big amount of data processing between the cloud and the machines um, but is there any infrastructure right now to kind of handle this well everybody is waiting for 5g at the moment <laughs> <laughs> us too <laughs> yeah. no that's true i think i mean the the question would will be what what is a robot? Yeah? Is a crane a robot? Is a, I don't know, yeah? another building machinery a robot? Uh, and like this is one thing. The other thing is that what is probably hard to solve is that you have a lot of processes at the same time. Yeah? So at the production line in the car, you have, okay, process one, I don't know, the car chassis, then you have the painting, then you have this, and then you have this. So it's a very linear process. At the construction site, everything is working at the same time, you know, and people are interfering with each other workspaces. So I think this is one of the biggest problems probably that we have to face is how to organize or how to reorganize a construction site uh, according to safety, according to this man-machine interaction, yeah, where at the same time, people uh, are working together with machines and you have this different way of uh, scale factor. Yeah? You have machines like that, but then you have machines building tall and then the person is like that. So, so this will be interesting. This is um, something I'm really looking forward to researching into because that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and you have supervisor. Sorry? And you have supervisor. Supervisor? No. Sun or rain. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the weather. Yeah, exactly. The, the, I mean, that's what we called, we, we have to work in unstructured environment. Um, that's why we also do a lot of research into where we do not use cameras. Because, you know, when as soon as you have cameras 
and it's windy or rainy or foggy or whatever, then all of a sudden, you, yeah, you, you can't see. Or if it's dusty, for instance, uh, I, I showed one of the examples, yeah, <laughs> totally dust. And I think in the automatic steel industry, yeah. it's more, you know more about the uh, timeline. Exactly. The timeline. We, from my office, we are watching to a instructor. I think she needs a micro. I'm sorry. Sure. Okay. Sure. Um, we have a construction area, yeah. and there we can see if the uh, stuff is coming in time, not in time, exactly. and you can look at the person's work there if they're going to the phone and call and yeah, going to be exactly. nervous. And I think it's... In the or the whole line stops if something yes, is or happening. It's numb yeah. Or the, we have uh, coldness and there is no one yeah. anywhere there, there because it's too cold exactly. for yeah. some stuff to I do. I mean, exactly. I mean, that's, that's a good point because, uh, yeah, in the car manufacturing, if there is a problem, there is an emergency stop for the whole line. Yeah? Construction is actually all the time problem solving in real time. Yeah, we always have a problem, and there's nothing that you stop a construction site, even though, the, for instance, the concrete does not appear or something. Still, they they are continuing. Yeah, yeah, that that's true. That's interesting. Very interesting. Any other questions? I think we have got time for two more. <laughs> First of all, for example, if you lose the electricity, you also exactly. you have a full stop at yeah. the, um, the same with now the car and, and now. With the, uh, yeah. If something happens, uh, yeah, you can't repair it anymore. But uh, to my question, how do you see all of this in like let's say twenty to thirty years from now? You're really into the topic, so. What yeah. do you think? I mean, it, things developed really quickly. The yeah, last I think decades. we will see a lot of changes in the next 10 years mm. because um, I, I realize that there is a certain drive now that, that industry actually is coming and wants to participate in the process actively because they know that they, they are facing problems in five to 10 years anyhow. On the one hand, they don't find people to work f that they work for. On the other hand, you know, the, the pressure is, is getting higher because a lot of projects fail because things happen and then all of a sudden it's not you know, two times as expensive, but we have now projects uh, that it's 10 times as expensive as calculated at the beginning. So, so, so construction is also very in supervision by society and also by politics. And also I think at the moment, yeah, everybody, also politics, they do know that they have to change something, also in terms of how to get affordable housing. And so, yeah, at the moment it's a good time to research into this topic because it's just at the beginning. <coughs> and I do hope that in my lifetime I will see a different construction site. I mean, that's a little bit, uh, yeah, why I'm happy to be where I am at the moment. Yeah. I have a question on how you develop your prototypes and stuff. Do you, like, ask real workers, for example, when, yeah, painting the wall, do you ask uh, people who actually do that? Or um, yeah, are you just... Especially the, the, the wall painting um, was hilarious because that <laughs> just didn't work as it yeah. should work. Yeah, of yeah. course. Yeah, usually this is something what we do. I mean, mm -hmm. we have we have steel artists, we have uh, people who have uh, carpenters knowledge in, in our team already. Mm -hmm. So I'm hiring uh, also a lot of people from the domains of material knowledge. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's true. Uh, the painting, we actually have to redo it mm. because yeah. it's just not how you would paint. Yeah. But this was like, you know, similar. It's a drive. It, yeah, no, it's it a was at 10 o'clock yeah. in the evening it's and the prototype. next day the, 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 the normal painter <laughs> yeah. would come. And so yeah. they said, oh, before, before the, the painter comes, we actually want to paint the, mm. like Sigrid's office. Yeah? So this was more or less the background. So this was... Uh, at, <laughs> 
an hour, let's try and do it. Mm. Yeah, so and not uh, a real painter yeah. painting. Yeah. And another question that I have is kind of related to David's initial question is, um, Now, because I don't have any background in architecture whatsoever, and but I know that um, in that area there is huge discussion on like yeah uh, robots and stuff, but people are really afraid of that, especially people who work in construction now. Do you know if there are any like um, measures planned to inform? The workers that are currently working in, in construction sites um, about what is planned in 10 years and where they should focus on and stuff. Yeah. So that, because as you said, in England, I think it was, so there will be, in England, I think you said, yeah. uh, there will the be UK. not enough mm -hmm. uh, yeah, stuff around for Except building the, houses. But I think the, the public doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. So there's always the fear robots will take away their work. Well, yeah, that's, that's the problem with media. Yeah? Yeah. And also the problem with uh, probably the films that we know from robotics. Yeah? Yeah. So, um, I mean, the only thing that we can do in this field is educate, educate, educate. And the other thing is uh, what I maybe wanted to show and at the very beginning uh, or in the end, is that we actually, that we actually um, started a center for construction robotics together with companies, yeah, with market leaders mm -hmm. in this field. Uh, because then we can, we, when we have them on, at the table, mm -hmm. yeah, we can A, share uh, knowledge, we can B, discuss what is the need of uh, construction, And see, we can actually also uh, help their people educate. So the idea will be that we will have um, um, a research construction site in, an, in the next five years, uh, where then people can just try out processes similar what we do in our indoor facilities at the moment. Yeah. So then, uh, I mean, I can just realize that. Um, Also through our networks, architects, they have, like our students have lost the fear from robotics. Yeah? If, if you think about that now we support about 100 universities, there, there are about 20 to 30,000 people coming out each year worldwide with robotic knowledge in architecture and in construction. And in five to ten years, they are the, they are the decision makers. Yeah? So it's just a matter of education. Okay. Yeah. Is there one last question? If not, then I would like to ask one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, uh, I was wondering about um, you talking about talents. Um, yeah. And I think on both sides, I mean, first of all, there are the people who, who do the jobs now okay. and who will maybe be replaced. But at the same time, also the talents. How hard is it to find the, the talents, talents to actually um, work with the robots? I mean, isn't it very challenging to find the, the hacks or the human resources to really apply yourself to, um, to all technology? Um, or to, to what extent is the vision to have an autonomous robot which is so easily to use that you can just press build yeah. house? <laughs> I think... Um We do need a lot of people from different backgrounds just to, 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 uh, um, to get active yeah, in, this, in, 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 this, um, in this field. Because, I mean, we, we have a lot of examples. <coughs> For instance, when we think about the World Wide Web and also about Facebook and Amazon and so on, I think a lot of people just miss the point uh, by just doing the same. Yeah? And so there are a, lot, a, a couple of companies who actually lead this data knowledge. Um, uh, I think it, it is important also for robot manufacturers that they know what users want to do with their robots. So I think the users Uh, have to take this active role because then the robots can can become better 
or even we see a lot of architects and artists, they just start building robots because they're not happy enough with industrial robots. We just use industrial robots because they are reliable and, and I do not have the mechanical engineering background to build my own robot. Yeah? So I just misuse tools very often for what I want to do. But uh, I, I truly believe that um, if we want the robots to do the things in the near future, what we want them to do, we have to be part of the design process. Of the, of the robots, but also of, of the use cases, what we want them to do. Um, yeah, so, so that's why we try to de democratize this process, mm -hmm. that we, that, that we uh, try to uh, create this technology transfer and to make it very easy so that people can just get hold on, of a piece of software and then they just can do it by themselves. They do not need uh, a programmer that do, do not need a mechanical engineer. In nowadays, you can just 3D print end effectors for I don't know 30 euros or something, and you can just do a process. Yeah, so I, I, a lot of people now do gripping devices. They do just by 3D printing. So I think uh, um, it, it's more and more accessible. And the more accessible the te technology is, the more you lose or society loses the fear, and the more you believe that, um, or, or you have the confidence that te this, te this technology can help you and assist you and not um, take away your jobs, for instance, uh, because then you can also use it for your own purposes, maybe. Thank you very much. This okay, thank you too. <laughs> no, no, thank you very much. <laughs>